master and my king, Jesus. You're my Lord, my everything, Jesus. It's your blood that made me clean, hallelujah, hallelujah. Sing, Jesus, you're my master and my king, Jesus. You're my Lord, my everything, Jesus, it's your blood that made me clean. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ready?
pray together. Jesus, indeed there is something about your name. That was the name the angel told Joseph to give to his son. For his people will be saved. He will save them from their sins. So Jesus, we thank you that today as we worship, we can call upon your name. We can thank you that that we worship in your name that we pray in your name. But more than the name, it's you. Our Savior, our Redeemer. We thank you for the relationship that we have with you. We thank you that you loved us before we ever loved you. We thank you that you found us We thank you that you saved us. We thank you that you have invited us to walk with you, to journey with you. Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege to worship you today. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. You know, I think if you want to learn something about someone, one of the best ways to do it is to take a journey with them. If there's somebody you want to get to know, you travel with them and you'll find out a lot about that person. If you want to find out something about somebody, jump in a car with them and drive across the country. You'll learn a lot about that person. Fire up the RV and take a trip with someone and you'll learn a lot about that person. Go backpacking with someone in the wilderness and I promise you, you will learn things about that person. Maybe the greatest journey of all, if you want to learn something about someone, marry them. (laughs) Right? Wow, you learn all kinds of things when you go through the journey of marriage. We've been married almost 40 years now, and we're still learning about each other. Uh, When you journey with someone, you learn a lot about one another. Today, we continue our series for Lent 
about journeying with Jesus. And uh, we're sort of asking the question, what does it look like to journey with Jesus? What do you learn about Jesus when you journey with him? And it's all based on uh, Matthew chapter 4, these three simple words that Jesus spoke to Peter and Andrew and to James and John when he said to them, come follow me. Come follow me. What that is is an invitation to journey with Jesus. And the invitation that he gave to Peter and Andrew and James and John, I believe he gives to us today. And what amazes me about that invitation, come follow me, Jesus doesn't tell us where we're going. He doesn't tell us how long we're going to be journeying. He doesn't tell us what to take. He doesn't even tell us what we're going to do. He simply says what? Come, follow me. Last week we started this series, Pastor Willie Nolte said Jesus did reveal to us the big thing that we do on the journey. He said, I will make you what? Fishers of men and women. So on this journey, what we want to do over the next several weeks is walk through some of the gospel and see what it's like to walk with Jesus. See what it's like to follow Jesus the Savior. And today, we're going to get going on that journey uh, at the end of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 23. I invite you to open up your Bible, turn on your telephone app, however you want to interact with God's Word, or just watch up on the screen. Verse 23, Matthew 4, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. When you journey with Jesus, one of the first things that you discover is that Jesus was attractional. Jesus is attractional. What do we mean by that? Jesus attracted people to him. Verse 25 says, large crowds followed him. As you go through the Gospels, you'll see Jesus preaching literally to thousands of people. Now think about that for a second. How big were the speakers that he used to speak to thousands of people? Um, how much, how many laser lights did he have? How much of a smoke machine did he have? Jesus taught and preached to thousands of people and other places in the gospel. It says that uh, it was so uh, hectic, so many people around Jesus pressing in on him that uh, he would have to escape and go up to a mountaintop just to get alone and pray, to get away from the crowds. In one instance, he wanted to teach. He was by the Sea of Galilee. There were so many people that Jesus had to go out in a boat and preach from a boat. We're also told that at different times, children flocked to Jesus. There was something about Jesus that was attractional. He was a magnet, and he brought people to himself. So the question we want to ask today is simple. What made Jesus so attractional? What was that what was there about him that made people flock to him? Let's begin by first of all saying what did not make Jesus attractional. It wasn't his appearance, okay? 
Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2, the prophet was talking about the coming Messiah, about the person that God would send one day. And this is what Isaiah said about the Messiah. He said that this Messiah had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Now, Isaiah is not saying that Jesus was ugly. But what he is clearly saying was there was nothing about his appearance that made people flock to him. Years ago, I shared that verse in a sermon. And after church, a woman got mad at me. She said, that's not my Jesus. My Jesus was good looking. I didn't say it, but what I wanted to say was that's not the Jesus in the Bible. <laughs> Isaiah said there was nothing about his appearance that attracted people to him. So it had to be something else. And again, I'm not saying Jesus was ugly, so don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you what the prophet said. There was nothing about his appearance that drew people to him. So what made him attractional? What made people flock to him? Let me suggest from Matthew chapter 4 and just these three verses, there are three things that made Jesus so attractional. Number one, it was his method. It was his method. Uh, Jesus went out to the people. Verse 23, it says, Jesus went throughout Galilee. How many of you saw the movie Field of Dreams? One of my favorite movies of all time. I cry at the end of that movie every time. <laughs> Dad, do you want to have a catch? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> What's the um, phrase in that movie that's so famous? Build it and they will come. I'm going to suggest to you that Jesus would not have been a fan of that philosophy. <laughs> Jesus built nothing and the people came because Jesus went to the people. I'm not against church buildings whatsoever. If you're part of Inspire, we pray that one day we'll have a church building. But my friends... The church building is not what attracts people. Jesus attracts people. His method was to go out. Yes, crowds were attracted to Jesus, but Jesus went to them first. Repeatedly in the New Testament, we see words like go and sent. The Great Commission, Jesus says go and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. Go to Judea, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. It says Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. Jesus was not a fan of build it and they will come. Jesus went to the people. That was his method. The second thing I see in Matthew 4 is Jesus' message. Matthew tells us that Jesus proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God. As he traveled around this, this area of Galilee, he preached and he taught about the kingdom of God. Now, a part of me fears that in uh, 2020 in the United States, that doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, we're not really into kingdoms, are we? Uh, the United States was founded proudly by rejecting a king. And the idea of a kingdom is sort of foreign to our way of thinking. But to the first century Jew, this would have resonated because in first century uh, Israel, they were under occupation by the Roman Empire and had been for centuries. 
Rome had taken over that part of the world and the Jews were under the Roman rule and they hated it. And for hundreds of years, they were waiting for God to send the Messiah and the Messiah would free the people from the evil Roman Empire. So when Jesus shows up and begins preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand, the people start thinking, is this it? Is, this, is he the one that God has sent to free us from the Roman Empire? This wasn't new in Jesus' day. There were other people who had led rebellions against Rome that ended in disaster. There were other men who had collected followers and incited them to riot and rebel, and Rome squashed it. But maybe Jesus would be the one that would free the people from the evil Roman Empire. But when Jesus preached the kingdom of God, he was doing something entirely different that had ever been done before. Jesus wasn't training killers and revolutionaries. He was acting as if God was already the king. He was acting as if things were already set right. The kingdom of God is at hand. And when Jesus came, people discovered that disease could not cripple people. That a person could not be sent to the grave before their time. If God was sovereign, evil spirits would lose their grip. And by healing people, Jesus pointed to God's kingship. Jesus' plan was not to bring death on Israel's enemies. His plan was to bring life to God's children. And every person that he healed was just another example of God freeing people from sin and death. Jesus' message of the kingdom of God had never been heard before. It would not be accomplished through uprising and rebellion. It would be accomplished by the sacrifice on the cross. His message attracted the multitudes. We have his method, we have his message. Thirdly, we have his ministry. Verse 23, he was healing, Matthew said, every disease and sickness. And every time Jesus healed somebody's sickness, somebody's disease, every time he cast out a demon, every time someone who was crippled walked again, do you know what happened? More people came. More people wanted to be healed. More people wanted to be set free. More people wanted to see. More people wanted to walk. More people wanted to meet the man who changed people's lives. Why did Jesus heal people? Two reasons. One, he loved them. Jesus healed people because he loved them. But the greater reason, Jesus healed people because it authenticated his power and his authority. Jesus came proclaiming that he was the son of God. Jesus came proclaiming he was the Messiah. And the miracles, the healings, were demonstrations of his power and his ability. So we have his method, we have his message, we have his ministry, and people, it says in Matthew, news began to spread around Galilee and people began to come to him. Jesus became attractional. And that's a cool story for the first century. 
But this is even cooler. Jesus is still attractional today. Amen. Jesus is still attractional today. People are still attracted to Jesus. You need to understand that there are people all around you. There are people in your circle of influence. There are people in your zip code of life who would be highly attracted to Jesus if you just pointed them to him. I chuckle. You hear me talk about Facebook a lot. I chuckle about my Christian, some of my Christian friends on Facebook who adapt or adopt the attitude that the world's going to hell in a handbasket. You know what I'm talking about? Culture's finished. Everybody's rebelling against God. And the whole thing is, woe is me. I look at the world in a different way. I see a world who still can be attracted to Jesus. Amen. For all the people that see the gloom and despair, I see opportunity. If the world is filled with gloom and despair, they need light. They need hope. They need Jesus. So our job is to do what? Point to Jesus. Point to Jesus. Point to Jesus. God has given us amazing opportunity in this time of history to point people to Jesus because people are still attracted to him. We have this thing at a Inspired Church, seven things you need to know about us. The very first thing we tell people that you need to know about Inspired Church is it's all about Jesus, period. We want to be about Jesus. We want to be a church, people who point people to Jesus. That's what we want to do. And then one of those other things on that list is we want to be about what? See, how's that go, Brian? Inspired Church wants to be about what we are, and not about what we're not. How's that go? About what we're for and not what we're against. Thank you. We want to be for what we're for. We want to be known for what we're for, not what we're against. There, thank you. That's why we've got Brian around here. He keeps me on track. We want to be known for what we're for, not what we're against, because we believe Jesus has the ability today, the passion today. Jesus has the power today and the desire today to still bring people to his side, to still bring people into relationship with him, to still say to men and women, come follow me. Jesus is still attractional, but attraction was never his goal. Attraction was never Jesus' goal. You see, there's a difference between being attracted to Jesus and being committed to Jesus. Jesus was never interested in gathering a crowd. In fact, there are times in the gospel, it seems like he said some tough things and intentionally drove people away. As you look at Matthew 4, there's this big crowd following him. The very next chapter is the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon and teaching given in human history. And if you read the Sermon on the Mount, honestly, it is hard teaching. A lot of what Jesus said in that sermon would drive people away because Jesus wasn't interested in attracting a crowd. What he was interested in was attracting and making disciples. Jesus wanted to transform people's lives. And he wants to do that today. I don't know where you are in life with this journey with Jesus, but I want to let you know that Jesus invites you to move from the crowd and move to commitment. Jesus invites you to move from the crowd to the committed. Because the problem with crowds, 
They don't hang in there. One of the most famous crowds in the New Testament was the crowd on Palm Sunday. As Jesus entered into Jerusalem, everybody had their palm branches. They were lining in the streets and they were chanting, Jesus, Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna. Just a few days later, Jesus goes to the cross and the crowd is gone. Everybody left him. Crowds bail when the excitement dies. Crowds bail when life gets difficult. But disciples, committed people to Jesus Christ, remain strong. It's possible that you're here today and you've been thinking about Jesus for a while. Maybe you've been coming to church with your spouse or with a friend and, and you're like the crowd. You, you see Jesus and you're like, man, this is interesting. And if that's who you are, I'm really glad. I'm so thankful that you're a part of the crowd that's watching Jesus. But I want to invite you to move from the crowd into a committed follower of Jesus Christ. Come. Follow me, Jesus said, and I'll change your life. Jesus is looking for committed men and women who will follow him wherever he goes, no matter what happens. I just want to invite you today to make that decision in your heart and in your mind to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, I don't know what your Holy Spirit is saying to people's hearts right now, but there might be somebody in this room right now who feels the urging of your Holy Spirit to get serious about journeying with you. They're feeling an urgency to get serious about being a disciple. They're feeling the need to make a commitment to follow Jesus. Lord, if that's the case, I just pray that right now you would speak to that person's heart in the quiet of their mind and their soul. They would say to you, Lord, I want to follow you. It's time to quit playing games. I want to journey with you. I want to stand apart from the crowd. And I want to be your disciple. So Lord, right now, I give you my heart. I give you control. I want to follow you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What a blessing it is today to be able to share communion together. Communion is the gift that God gave to us to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. So today as we take communion, we invite anybody who's put their faith in Christ to share in the bread and the cup. The bread represents the body of Jesus which hung on the cross for our sins. The, the juice... The cup represents his blood, which was shed for the remission, the forgiveness, the cleansing from our sins. So today as we take the bread and we take the cup, we remember. We remember Jesus. Now the way we do communion and inspire might be a little different for you. We come to the tables. There's a table there, a table there. There's a table in the back. You go to the table that you choose to do. We've made a change today. Remember I told you earlier, flexible. 
we need to be flexible as a church. Today we're going to what's called a two-cup communion. And that's simply, you're not going to see the tray with the bread today. Instead, you take a cup from the tray, and there are two cups, one stacked on the other. The bottom cup has your bread. The top cup has your juice. Do you understand that? Okay, good. A lot of you have already done that in other churches. And that's just our way to be flexible and adapt to our world around us. So what I want to invite you to do is uh, take some time to pray. As Pastor Brian ministers through song, take time to pray. Whenever you're ready, come to one of the three tables. Uh, maybe you can come down these two center aisles and go back out the outside aisles. And then when everybody's been served, we will take the bread and the cup together. So prepare your hearts to remember Jesus. Weak and wounded sinner, lost and left to die. Oh, raise your head for love is passing by. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus and live. Now your burdens lifted and carried far away. And precious blood has washed away the stain. So sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus, and live. Like a newborn baby, don't be afraid to crawl, and remember when you walk, sometimes we fall. So fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus and live. Sometimes the way is lonely and steep and filled with pain. So if your scarred is dark and pours the rain, then cry to Jesus, cry to Jesus, cry to Jesus and live. When the love spills over and music fills the night, and when you can't contain your joy inside, Dance for Jesus, dance for Jesus, dance for Jesus, and live. And with your final heartbeat, kiss the world goodbye. Then go in peace and laugh on glory's side. And fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus, and live. Fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus, and live. The Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he is betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it 
in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's been a joy to worship together today. We invite you to join us again next Saturday. As you leave today, our ushers are going to be in the back because on Communion Saturday, we receive something called the Do Good Offering. It's just our opportunity as a church to provide financial assistance to people that need some help. It's our little opportunity to do good. So if you'd like to take part in that, feel free. Also, if you need prayer today in your life or prayer for a loved one or a friend, uh, we will have people in the room to the, in the back to the right that will be there to pray with you. Just feel free after worship to stop by, and uh, they're there to lift you up in prayer. Would you please stand? With your eyes wide open, receive the benediction. May the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, be yours today forevermore. As you go out into God's world, being God's people, doing God's work, and all of God's people said, Go in peace. Amen.